Hello everyone, my name is William Meter, and today I'm here to do a presentation on the dark night of the soul. Um, and um, the goal of this particular talk is to help you understand how the esoteric philosophy looks at this subject of the dark night experience. Um, and it's interesting too because um, often we think about it as a very negative thing and it would appear at face value to be negative, but in fact there's some real positivity underlying the dark night experience. Um, so my goal is for you to see that and to put it in the context of your own life and your own journey. Um, the dark night is inescapable. And um, it's one of those things that we have to understand is just built into the fabric of walking the spiritual path. You know, it's interesting because it was originally uh, coined the dark night of the soul experience by St. Uh, James, uh, sorry, St. John of the Cross. Um, he was a monk back in the 16th century, a uh, Carmelite uh, monk actually. And um, so he, he, in his work, began to coin that term. Um, and it, it, it represents a kind of um, darkness that seems to overcome us and we feel disconnected from the soul or God or the greater life that we have in the past felt connected to. Often there's a sense of feeling a bit deserted spiritually. Um, and yet it's understood that these are major transitions in consciousness. They represent um, uh, an undoing process. There's a bit of an undoing to it, but it's an undoing as a function of stepping into the next phase of your, the development of consciousness. Um, you could say it's an unfolding while at the same time an undoing. And um, so, so if you look at history though, you find that, you know, the dark night experience has been discussed or mentioned in much of the literature from different theological backgrounds and the great teachers of the past have had a dark night experience, probably more than one. Uh, look at the Christ, for instance. Uh, the Christ uh, 2000 years ago went through the Garden of Gethsemane crisis, which was a bit of a dark night experience, if you will recall. Or we might look at the Christ on the cross when felt feeling abandoned, said, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? And uh, so obviously that's a fairly significant dark night experience. Um, if we look at Prometheus um, in the ancient the European literature, we find that Prometheus, um, who was an agent of God, felt disconnected and was actually chained to a rock and uh, vultures were permitted to peck his liver, which is just a, it's a story about Prometheus being expelled from uh, God's favor and connection. Um, then you have Muhammad, who spent so much time brooding in the desert at times of trying to reconnect and understand his relationship, or the, or the Buddha, who spent uh, time under the Bodhi tree, insisting that, that the enlightened realization and the connection with divinity must come under that tree. And, and so we see that it, this whole idea of a dark night experience belongs to the very depth of the religious spirit there's always going to be times when you feel disconnected uh, and then later reconnected. Um, and so what I'm like wanting to do today is I want to go through seven major points for you to understand how this philosophy looks at the nature of the dark night experience. And so I'm, I'm going to have a, a, a slideshow and we'll talk about each of these points one by one. So let me get that uh, available for you to see. Okay, so hopefully you can see that now. And we are going to look at the very first point. And that is this, that um, it says key points about the dark night experience or the dark night of the soul experience. The first point is that it is first encountered when a person has entered onto what we call the probationary path. So let me explain what I mean by that. These terms sometimes can throw us off if we're not familiar with it. The probationary path is, is a part of the journey that happens after what we call the awakening. When a, for, for thousands of lifetimes, an individual is living their personality life. They're living their, their lower nature and developing their ego and personality. And although the soul is present, it's in the background and the individual can't really consciously sense the soul at all. 
Um, and for countless incarnations, the whole life is oriented toward building that outer garment that is what we call personality. And um, there, is, there is no real such thing as a dark night of the soul experience at that point, because at that point, the individual hasn't yet had a conscious realization of the soul. So, so what I guess I'm trying to say is that it's only, it's only when we um, are, when we are uh, uh, finally awakening to a higher impulse within us, when we are awakening to a higher kind of love within us, that we are awakening to the, the soul itself for the first time, or something we call the causal body, which is the container that is holding your soul's consciousness. But as I say, for countless incarnations, the individual, the personality is not conscious of that. It just simply is being personality and ego and cultivating a, a more um, integrated ego expression in the life. Um, so that's point number one. You, a person has to be on the probationary path to feel, to start having moments of feeling abandoned uh, by the soul. In fact, it's very interesting. You know, it is said that when a person has their first awakening, that often that awakening is fleeting. It's a sense that something divine took place deep inside, a flashing forth. They're awakening to the causal body, the soul for the first time, but it is fleeting and it goes. And then an individual struggles to find out how to recapture that experience. So right at the very beginning, the very first inkling of the soul deep within is, um, is followed by a sort of an, an immediate dark night experience. So that's point number one. You have to be on the, on the path to uh, awaken to the soul because it's not in uh, to, to feel a dark night experience because it's on the path where you've had an awakening to the soul and therefore when it, it vanishes at the dark night moment, you realize something's missing. The second point is this, it creates the feeling of being abandoned or forsaken. Now, what's important to think about in this context is that although it does hold that feeling about it, um, I think it's important to realize that it's an, it's an illusion, that you're really not disconnected from divinity at all. You're not at all. Um, it, it is a time of forcing an individual to turn inward, to look at themselves with greater honesty, with greater, a greater sense of, uh, of who am I, and am I really doing my best to bring my best forward? In a way, a dark night experience creates a sense of disconnect with divinity in a way that kind of forces us to begin to really think more about how, how can I be a better person? Um, but it's difficult, admittedly, because, you know, you feel like um, you feel like you're um, you had something and then you, you lost it. Um, and and it, it, it kind of makes it um, when, when a person's going through a dark night experience and feels that sense of forsakenness, there's a there's a sense that um, no matter what you say to them to the to it encourage them, there's always going to be this sense of doubt that. Uh, that that any kind of reassurance is often the personality will doubt the value of that because it's not in their immediate experience. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it will certainly come back. So it always creates this feeling of abandonment and a sense of doubt that it'll re reappear. Um, now, one of the things that I'd like to share with you about this is that, and how to put this, um, one of the, there's many reasons why the dark night experience occurs, but one of them has to do with the idea that there are times when the soul creates the dark night experience to, quote, arrest the hastening personality. And that's a really, really important concept, to arrest the hastening personality. What do we mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that when you're on the path, your personality is being inspired by the soul at various times, you feel like you're, you're really moving forward with your spirituality and you sense that you're evolving in your consciousness in a very serious, real way. But oftentimes the personality, the lower self that's enthused about 
living a spiritual life, that personality sometimes becomes, shall I say, over-enthused, or it becomes, um, it wants enlightenment now. It doesn't realize that it has to go through some real transformational processes. So in, there are times when actually the soul will create the darkened experience to, to, to stop that personality from charging forward prior to it doing the deep work of transforming itself uh, in order to earn your way in. Because you know what it is. You know, the truth is that uh, you have to earn your way to enlightenment. We all do. We have to, you know, faith just sort of takes you to the beginning of the path in a certain sense. But then there's the hard work of transforming the personality so that it becomes the rightful servant of the soul. And as that personality becomes more believing that there is a soul trying to inspire it, uh, it, 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 it sometimes um, wants the fast track, uh, wants the fast track to enlightenment. And there are times when the, it has to be put down by creating the dark night experience. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, so having said that, let's go to the third point. Um, as it says here, uh, it results in a feeling of losing one's spiritual direction. So it's not just that I feel like I was connected to something sacred and now I'm not, but it also puts a whole different coloring on the question of what is my purpose? Where am I going? What is the correct spiritual direction to follow? You might have thought you knew. You, you, you might have thought that you had it. Um, and, and, um, and now it's all put into question. Now, the thing to keep in mind is when we talk about spiritual direction, we're really talking about the soul's purpose, really. Um, and the, the subject of the soul's purpose can be approached in many ways. Um, for instance, the soul, one, one of the clues to understanding the soul's purpose has to do with what is called the trend of one's thinking. Um, you know, how the idea here is that um, look at the trend of your interests, the trend of your passion. Uh, and it is, it is believed, a great master once said this, that uh, look at the trend of your thinking and, and, and see that trend and the golden thread underlying that trend, because that golden thread is very much related to what the calling is of the soul. Um, and so one of the ways to start to recapture that sense of direction is to recapture in your mind what it is that fascinates your mind, what engages your consciousness, what gets you back into a thought process that really makes you feel like there's a reason for your being. Um, keep in mind that your soul, your causal body, is found on the higher mental plane. So the soul has a tendency to, to launch trends of lofty thought. So one of the things to always remember, particularly when you feel like you've lost your way directionally on a soul level, is to ask yourself, what do I like to think about? What has historically been the thing that is just constantly my mind wants to go back to over and over, even though right now I'm in the dark night experience and I, my mind isn't there at all, what has historically been that? Because that's really important. Um, and, 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 and so nonetheless, in the dark night, there will be a tendency to have this sense of loss of direction. Um, you know, it's very interesting. When I think about this subject, I always think about the sign of Sagittarius. You know, in, astro in esoteric astrology, Sagittarius is all about direction. You know, the archer who's shooting the arrows, you may not know this, but the arrows he is shooting have a name in mythology. They're called the arrows of aspiration. Uh, so always uh, Sagittarius is about aiming at, visioning of, striving toward, or aspiring toward. And even though we might not all be born in Sagittarius, the truth is we all have an arrow to aim. We all have a sense of, where am I putting my life? And we want to aim that arrow to, to the extent that it's not just a steady aim, but it's almost as if you become the arrow itself. And ideally, that's the goal. We want to strive. We want to commit our lives to the vision we hold. And yet, during the dark night experience, we might feel like we've lost it. Or we were in error somehow, and we thought we understood it, and now we don't. 
But always the solution to this is time, to give yourself enough time and to, to allow the process to work it through. Remember, it's, it's really in a way that it, it's about darkness as a prelude to new light. It's always darkest before the dawning hour. And in a way, that's a very fundamental principle in the study of the dark night of the soul experience. It's always darkness before the soul's dawning hour. Um, let's take a look at the fourth point. The fourth point, the dark night of the soul experience will differ according to one's ray and his or her point in evolution. So that's quite important to keep in mind because just to, to reacquaint some of you with this, um, it is said that there are seven types of souls in the world today. Seven, think of a ray as being a lens, a lens through which life looks out. And that lens is a lens that, or it's sometimes called an organizing principle of consciousness. It organizes perception. It organizes patterns of perception and action and reaction, and even defines the tendencies of your interests. Um, so there are seven types of lenses, you might say, or rays, and that your soul is found upon one of them. And, that, and, and that's why in this philosophy, it's understood that there, these seven types of souls will seek to, to serve humanity in vastly, vastly different ways. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, a first ray soul, which is called the ray of will and power, will tend to serve humanity through executive tendencies, often is attracted to leadership opportunities, as well as it is the ray that governs the whole institution of government within any society. So there, for instance, there would be a disproportionate number of first ray souls working within in what we call the department of government, regardless of the country or the type of government. Um, the second ray types are, second ray souls are people that are, it's called the ray of love and wisdom. People along this line of consciousness are, often um, inclined to see life through the lens of, or wanting to serve, I should say, through the lens of, of teaching or of the healing arts or many of the helping tendencies or professions of life. A third ray soul is very much related to serving humanity through systems thinking. And often they find themselves in sometimes technical or, or um, actually the business world and economics is where you find a lot of third ray souls. Fourth ray is the ray of uh, that uh, sometimes is called the ray of harmony through conflict, but it's also called the ray of beauty. It's the ray that governs culture and the arts and mediation tendencies. And so sometimes people with a lot of fourth ray in their life would see spirituality and want to bring it forth often through culture and the arts within a society. Fifth ray people are, are people that see life through the lens of science. It's called the ray of concrete knowledge and science. And um, so their inclination to, to serve in that way. Sixth ray people are often, it's called the, the sixth ray is called the ray of idealism and devotion. That type of soul is inclined to serve humanity through religious endeavor. It, the sixth ray governs all theology around the world, but it also is the ray that has a lot to do with causations. For instance, to fight for a cause, to save the whales, for instance, uh, that kind of passionate conviction toward a, um, a, 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 an avenue of service and an, a set of ideals is very much uh, a sixth ray thing. And the seventh ray is called the ray of ceremonial order and magic. And this particular type of soul will be much more inclined to want to bring heaven to earth. They're sometimes called the practical mystics. They want to repattern the way things are in the tangible, real manifestation of, of humanity in our culture, in our, how we do things, how we build social structures, and to redesign things so that the best of the human spirit can find a more adequate container to be expressed through. All of those are, that's just a very, very quick overview of the rays. But my point is that I'm trying to share with you is that, that the kind of dark night experience you have will have some bearing often, often on the ray that you are. So for instance, uh, let's say a second ray soul, a second ray soul. And let's say that as a person that's very much um, committed, has been committed to feeling that their purpose in the world is to be uh, a teacher of some sort, um, which is 
very common with second ray soul types uh, and incredible, an incredible function of service. But uh, when, they re- when they go into, let us say, a dark night experience, that pulls them back. And they might, a, a lot of the dark night might be colored by the perception that they're not good teachers. Or it was, I, I, I was off and I, I never really understood what I was teaching. Or, you know, they'll question their own, their own passion, their own interests, their own skills. They'll question that. They'll doubt it. Um, and that would be true of all the ray types, that there would be a tendency to doubt, to question um, uh, something that is so fundamental to who you are. Um, for instance, a sixth ray soul is governed by d- ideals. A sixth ray person is a person that says, aim at an ideal, and that ideal is the way to God, and live your life from that idealistic perspective. And there's truth to that, by the way. There's a uh, particularly for sixth ray people, that's the way in. But you might get the person that, uh, who goes through the dark night, who's on the sixth ray line, and that person is now recognizing or believing, usually falsely, that their ideals have failed them. Um, and that the, the, the ideals they were living by are, are, are superficial and not real at all, and so they doubt them. So I won't go through all seven, but I'm just trying to give you a sense that the, the nature of the darkness that is often evident in a dark night experience is very much qualified or leans toward something pertaining to the very ray that you are on. Okay, um, let's go to the next one, number five. Often it is often the, the darkness before the dawning hour. Now, this is a really important concept. I briefly stated that earlier as well. Uh, One of the things I'd like you to keep in mind when thinking about this is this idea that one of the things that is um, very strong in this philosophy is the subject of initiation. You know, we go through these periods where major transformations take place, initiations, and it's a huge subject in its own right. What is initiation? How do we understand it? That sort of thing. Um, but it is um, in many cases, and certainly not all cases, but in some cases, um, the dark night experience can be a prelude to a, a spiritual initiation. Um, it, it often blindness does precede an initiation, uh, and this uh, this is uh, true. Uh, regardless of which initiation we might be talking about. Like, for instance, let's go back to, I mentioned uh, Jesus a a little earlier, and I mentioned that Jesus had a dark night of experience, two of them actually, just before the full crucifixion, one while before the cross in in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the other one on the cross. But Jesus was actually approaching what we, and going through what we call the fourth initiation, which, by the way, is also called the crucifixion. Um, and so here at the moment of, of liberation, suddenly God disappears. Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Right at the moment, just prior to the earned initiatory rite to, of passage, in, in his case, into full liberation. Um, so think of, think, of, um, think of these dark night experiences, when we look at it in that light, think of it as... Um, a time of testing, and it is a time of testing. Um, and think of it as a, a, a kind of, um, it's, it's a system that's trying to make sure that you've actually done the inner work and that even when the soul seems disconnected, you can still hold what it has already given you and you can go through your life or the next period of time without the soul's connection, without the soul's connection, or without God's connection, let us say, and you can go through that um, and still live your outer life as a demonstration of higher values and as a demonstration of the consciousness of the soul, even though the soul seems disconnected with you. You see, that's so important when it comes to the subject of initiation. It it, it is said by a great master that one is initiated, no, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. One is initiate, before they are initiated. In other words, you have to demonstrate the consciousness of a certain initiatory level of evolution leading to enlightenment. You have to demonstrate it 
as a prelude to actually going through the initiation. But in that process of demonstration as a prelude, there's often a dark night experience that is right there as well, cutting you off from the connection to the greater life to make sure that it really is a kind of wisdom and a kind of understanding of life and a perspective on life that is now f truly integrated into your personality and can be functional and effective in service to the world, even without the continued inspiration of the soul. Again, it's about proving yourself. It's about proving yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is I, I want to highlight something here that might be helpful for us. And to do that, I want to show you a different slide. So I'll come back to this sequence in a minute. But let me, let me uh, bring something else forward for just a moment. Uh, and this has to do with a kind of irony about the whole subject of the dark night of the soul. Because you see, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, it's, um, it's a misleading statement even to say the dark night of the soul. Because you see, it really, what we, what we call a dark night of the soul experience isn't really a dark night of the soul experience. It's really a dark night of the personality experience. It's a huge misunderstanding in a way because it's not that your soul is experiencing darkness. It's that your personality, the, per, the lower self is experiencing the darkness. So for centuries, we've been using the term dark night of the soul and I do it all the time. But if we get technical about it, it's an incorrect statement. It's, it's really the dark night of the personality. Um, and, and, and yet there is one experience that is truly a dark night of the soul. I want to show you another image that might help you understand this. So let me get that visual for you. Okay, so what I've got here is two columns, the dark night of the personality and the dark night of the soul. Now in, in this, you can see that we've got three structures, monad, soul, and personality. Now, for those of you who are well-versed in this, you know probably what the monad is, but there might be people listening to this that are rather new to theosophy and esotericism. So let me briefly say what monad is. Monad is another word for pure spirit its beingness. Monad is the spark of life that gives rise to your, your experience of consciousness. Monad is beyond the soul in each of us. The monad is, uh, it, it's actually, I believe the, the word comes originally from Pythagoras, and it means um, it's rooted in the, the word mono, the one, meaning it's where you are interfacing with the total oneness of all things. Um, if you, if you, to just to make a difference for you, think of the soul in you, think of the soul in you as the Christ in you. Think of the monad in you as the God in you. Now, you and I are not at a place in our evolution where we can consciously experience the monad. That's way beyond our ability. You have to be at a certain level of consciousness before, and it's really just very quick, it's very soon before enlightenment, full enlightenment, that you become more conscious of the monad. For us, it's unconscious. Um, and, and, um, and yet what we are conscious of is the soul and the personality. And so when we say the dark night of the soul, if you can see at the bottom here, it says often called the dark night of the soul, even though this is really a dark night of the personality, periodically occurs in the life of every disciple, it's imposed by the soul upon the hastening personality, and it pro provides time for the integration of lessons. So that's kind of, I'm just kind of swinging back to what I mentioned earlier, that you can see that it's a disconnect, between, it says rapport established, though it is temporarily disconnected. And that's because one of the explanations given on this slide is that it's to arrest the hastening personality that wants the next step when it hasn't fully integrated the previous lessons that the soul has given it. So it's the soul itself that does the disconnecting. 
On the other side, you see on the right side, the dark night of the soul, the actual dark night of the soul experience is actually when you have a fully soul infused personality. Um, uh, by that, I mean that the soul and the personality are now fully fused and no longer does the personality have any kind of undue sway on the, on the soul's agenda. That's called initiate consciousness. And that too is a bit out of reach for, for all or most of us listening to this, but it is the long-term goal for all of us to completely fuse the soul and the personality together so that the lower self becomes the rightful servant of the soul, because that's all your personality is really for. Your personality, it's, you might say its destiny and its purpose is to be the outer garment used by the soul as a function of service to humanity's upliftment. And each initiation that we talk about is really a process of creating more and more soul infusion. And um, there comes a point when there's complete soul infusion, and that's when you wake up to the monad for the first time. And so you wake up to the monad for the first time at that point, and, and yet after that, there will be times when there will be a disconnect. And one of those biggest disconnects at that time is the fourth initiation, which is what Master Jesus took 2,000 years ago. So what Master Jesus went through is a true night of the soul experience. What you and I go through is on the left side of this chart, it's really a dark night of the personality experience that we tend to call a dark night of the soul experience. Just if you read down at the, on the right side here, it says, this is the true dark night of the soul, periodically occurs in the life of every initiate, and it's imposed by the monad, is prelude to destruction of the causal body, and ensures that no unredeemed karma remains to hinder. There's a lot to that. Um, that's giving us some idea of what it means to take the fourth initiation, because what's, what happens is that the, at the fourth initiation, the causal body itself is crucified. That's what's crucified. And um, it's also at that level where all karma must be, have been transformed and no longer is there any dissonance, which is what karma is, there's no longer any dissonance uh, within the system. Uh, and that's the true dark night. Uh, maybe it would be helpful if I just quickly showed you another graphic that just kind of gives you a sense of this process of soul personality fusion. Okay, so um, I've got three big steps here, as you can see, it's stages of infusion and here we have what is, there's three terms that are often used in the esoteric philosophy, the term the aspirant, the disciple, and the initiate. Um, the aspirant is where they've had their awakening. There's no soul infusion yet, but there's a recognition of the soul, soul and that's the beginning of the probationary path. So that's what I said earlier. That's when it's from that point forward that it is possible to have a dark night of the soul experience, which again really is a dark night of the personality experience. But then when you're more serious on the path, you move into the whole realm of discipleship where you have partial soul infusion. And that's when part of the personality is infused by the soul. And you have a growing commitment to the soul when living the life uh, in that phase. And it's what we call the path of discipleship. It means you are learning to be a disciple of your own soul, to be a disciple of your own higher promptings. That's discipleship. And that too is going to be, there are going to be moments where the personality is going to lose connection with the soul. And, and again, it's because of this, I, one of the reasons is because of um, the, the personality's too much in a hurry to create more soul personality fusion, it, it has to actually do some inner changes in order to accomplish that. And then it, again, it could also be related to readiness for initiation and the darkness before that dawning opportunity. Uh, and this is the third is the initiate life where you have the soul, full soul infusion, recognition of the monad, and you, you're on the path of initiation. Um, now, having said that, that just gives you a sense of it. So where you are on the path defines somewhat the nature and the intensity of 
a dark night experience, as well as what your ray nature is. Okay, so um, I think what I'll do is now get back to the other uh, slide that we were looking at, the sequence of ideas. Let me get that back up for you to see. Okay, so um, let's go to the next one, number six. It can be a test of your readiness and your trustworthiness. That's a, another, that's a bit similar to what I was just discussing. Um, think about it in the, in the sense that um, there's a certain point on the path where you, you become what is called a trusted disciple, a trusted disciple. And a trusted disciple is one whose consciousness has demonstrated enough soul infusion that there's no way that that personality is going to make a sharp turn to the left and starting, starting to go the way of what is called the way of Mahat, which means of pure mind, but it, it doesn't go with love. And it's sort of the black magical arts way. There's a point where, and it's a fairly far point, it's, it's, a, it's, it's shortly after the second initiation where you become what is called a trusted disciple. And again, it's also related to that sense of readiness, readiness for um, uh, an, an initiation opportunity. Uh, so let's take a look at the seventh point. And it is, it, it's initiated by the soul itself, as I mentioned. It's the soul itself that is creating the dark night experience, the dark night experience. One of the things I'd like to share with you is this, that again, remember that it's inevitable. You are going to have those moments. It's just inescapable. But it's important to know ahead of time that it's inescapable and that there's always going to be a dawn after that darkness. So one of the ways of just kind of conditioning in your consciousness is that understanding that this is built into the very fabric of the path itself. Um, but I want to expand our thinking about this now. I'd like to take it and look at it from the larger perspective and look at all of humanity for a moment. You know, it is said that humanity itself, possibly in this century, is approaching a great initiatory opportunity. And that what's trying to happen in the world today is that humanity is trying to figure out how to be one. And if it can't get that figured out pretty soon, well, we're all in big, pro there's big problems for us. We already see it. And so one of the very important concepts to understand in this philosophy is that the whole of humanity in a larger context is considered a single entity. Humanity as one being. And by the way, it has a soul and it has a personality. And it at times it too is struggling to transform the lower in support of the higher, just like that's happening to you and I. And the physics of the consciousness of the soul of humanity works exactly as the physics of the consciousness of the soul of an individual human being. And, and that includes the whole subject of the dark night experience. You see, that's what's happening today. In many ways, the crisis of the world today is a collective dark night of the soul experience. Because right now particularly, but even in the last few years, this has been a time when we can feel that, there, that something is building of a crisis. You know, it is said that humanity today is, quote, walking the burning ground. Walking the burning ground. The burning ground is the, the walking across the hot coals that are required in order for humanity to reach that new and dawning era for, for all of us. And so humanity itself is walking the burning ground, which is a type of dark night experience. And that dark night experience um, leaves us all feeling less connected. And now with this virus, we even have another element of it. And admittedly, it's one I didn't expect, but I've been kind of watching this dark night experience for some time. And we see it in economics, we see it in political systems, we see it in various social systems. 
we see we see the the burning ground when it comes to the tendency of humanity to become more separative rather than unitive. In fact, it has been a great master once said that the greatest obstacle to humanity's future is what he called, quote, the heresy of separateness, the heresy of separateness. And now with crisis and fear, that, that heresy becomes even more prominent, whether we're talking about separateness in terms of moving away from internationalism toward nationalism, or we're talking about that separateness as in building walls, or we're talking about that separateness as in um, uh, religious intolerance, or we're talking about the crisis around immigration issues around the world. All of these are manifestations of, as I said, the heresy of separateness. And all of them are amplified now because humanity collectively is feeling less and less disconnected or sorry, less and less connected, they feel, feel more disconnected from the soul of humanity. Because what is the soul of humanity anyway? I mean, how do we recognize it? And we recognize it in our collective higher values. The soul of humanity is that part of us that when we sense that inwardly we're all one, it's, the, it's your soul being an agent on behalf of the soul of humanity. And keep that in mind. When we say the soul of humanity, we're saying humanity has a single soul and that your soul, your individual causal body, is a cell within its beingness. And so when you're aligning with your soul, you are aligning with the soul of humanity. And yet collectively, humanity is going through this crisis and a lot of people that uh, are becoming less and less connected to their own soul through fear. The personality is being fearful. And as a result, less and less connected to the soul of humanity. Uh, and so we are in the burning ground phase right now. And uh, um, as I say, I had no premonitions or anything about that the next phase of the burning ground would be microbial. But in fact, it has become. And so the tension is mounting. And um, so all of humanity is entering this dark night experience. And we all, uh, so what do we do about it? Well, for those of us who are still feeling inwardly connected ourselves, and I hope many of you are still, that you become the promise of the future. You know, in this philosophy, there's something called the new group of world servers. The new group of world servers represents the sum total of all people on the planet who have had some measure of awakening to their higher consciousness, their soul's consciousness, who have had some measure of capacity to do the hard work of transforming the lower so that they can be more effective in expressing the higher through the lower, you might say and who have a growing burning sense of wanting to make an uplifting contribution to the betterment of something beyond themselves. And that's service. And the new group of world servers are now in their millions around the world. And undoubtedly many of you who may be listening to this presentation are members of that group, whether you're conscious of it or not, because it's an inner group, it's not an outer group. And at this time of human history and crisis, it's that group that is so needed now to help humanity get across this burning ground period and to help humanity navigate through this collective dark night of the soul experience. In that sense, you are needed more now than ever. All of us are more now than ever. And so this is the time to bring light into a dark world. That's what discipleship's about, to be a light bearer in places of darkness. And we don't have to look far to find where the darkness is. It's all around us right now. Um, but this is an opportunity. Now, if you yourself personally are feeling disconnected from your own higher consciousness, and so you're personally having a dark night experience, well, that's one thing. That... That requires you 
to remember what I said earlier, that this too shall pass, and that this is preparation, a darkness before a dawning hour of preparation for you to become more effective in your service. But those of you who still feel connected, and I hope most of you who are listening to this do, um, your opportunity to really, really make a difference in the, within the circumstances of your life uh, as a function of upliftment and in service to the soul of humanity, this is your time. This is our time. So, so often in this philosophy, there's this understanding that there's both um, many of the principles apply to the individual life, but they also apply to larger living systems. I'm talking about it from a humanity perspective as a whole now. If I looked at it from a national perspective, it's the same thing because also a nation is an entity. Here in the United States, the United States is not just a country, it's a being and it too has a soul and it too has a personality. And at this point, it too is struggling to transform the lower and, to, and, and, and a lot of resisting energies are rising in defiance. Um, so one of the wonderful things about this philosophy is that you, it, it, uh, everything that applies to the individual applies to larger living systems, including the dark night of the soul experience. So just to kind of wrap things up for us here, I just want you to understand that the dark night again is not something that you can avoid. It will happen. It will happen. Um, and it will pass. And it's, it's a process of creating a darkness so that your lower self can make more adjustments in its perceptual processes so that when the light does return, your lower self is far, far more capable of being a better servant on behalf of the soul than it was prior to the dark night experience. In that sense, the dark night is a very good thing. As I say, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of renewal that has an, un, it's an unwinding while at the same time, it's a renewing. Um, so think of it that way in your personal life, but always remember that this larger drama of humanity is, has to be taken in consideration because if you are really aligning with your soul and you're not in a dark night experience personally at any given time, you should start to feel the oneness of humanity because that's what the soul in each of us does. It does many things, but one of the things is it helps you to sense the underlying unit of field. And it's in that sensing of that unit of field that you begin to sense that fundamentally we are all one, not just in kind. Yes, we're, of course, we're one in kind. We're all in kind because we're all human beings, but we're one in essence, in soulful essence. And when you feel that inside you, then you're, you're experiencing not only the soul, but you're experiencing the a kind of intimacy with the soul of humanity. And it's from that place, deep inside, where the impulse to serve, the impulse to uplift should arise. So I hope you found this presentation to be of help. Um, and I call on all of us to, to uh, yeah, do our best at this very difficult time in human history. The dark night of the soul experience for humanity will pass. And to the extent that all of us can bring our very best uh, in terms of love and wisdom into the fabric of our lives, particularly when this isolation period is done, um, to that extent, um, the, soul of, uh, the soul of humanity will, will not only become more evident for, for all of humanity, uh, and we get back on it on an evolutionary track that is helpful to all of humanity. But I have a feeling, and in fact, no doubt, that for all of us, the soul of humanity will look well upon all of us as we try to serve the greater whole. Thank you for spending your time with me today.